Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar on employment essentials for tech businesses. My name is Sophie, I'm a lawyer in Legal Vision's employment team and I'm also joined today by my colleague Dixon who is also a lawyer in our employment team. Now, before we get stuck into it, just wanted to touch base regarding a couple of housekeeping items. Now, we will be emailing you a copy of this webinar recording, so there's no need to frantically take down notes from anything we discussed today. Um, at the end of the webinar, we will also be answering some of your questions, so please feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar through the chat function, and we'll answer as many of them as we can get through at the end. And finally, we do also ask that you please take the time to complete the survey after the webinar concludes, as we do really appreciate your feedback on these sessions. All right, so getting straight into it, in terms of today's agenda, we are going to be discussing a few key points really that are particularly relevant for tech businesses. So first of all, we're going to be looking at some of the minimum employment entitlements. Then we're going to be considering some of the relevant modern awards which apply to tech businesses. Then we're going to consider some of the distinctions between employees versus contractors. And then finally, we're going to be taking a look at some of the key contractual terms that we recommend, including in employment agreements, in particular clauses around confidential information, IP and restraints of trade. So we'll get straight into it and I'll now turn over to Dixon who's going to have a little bit of a chat to you around minimum employment entitlements. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Sophie. Well, the minimum entitlements for employees in Australia are the National Minimum Wage and the National Employment Standards or the NES. The National Minimum Wage is currently $20.33 per hour um, and normally changes on the 1st of July each year. The National Employment Standards are contained in the Fair Work Act and are the minimum standards for Australian employees. Now there are 11 minimum entitlements in the NES, NES uh, and these include uh, requests for flexible working arrangements, leave entitlements, notice of termination and redundancy pay. Casual employees only receive some of these NES entitlements, uh, including unpaid leave, um, offers and requests to convert from casual to permanent employment, and also getting a copy of the casual employment information statement uh, along with the fair work information statement when they start their new job. Casual employees also receive a 25% casual loading and that's to compensate them for not receiving the employment benefits of a full-time or part-time employee. It's important to note that a modern award, enterprise agreement or employment contract cannot exclude the NES or provide for conditions that are less than the national minimum wage or the NES. We'll now move to discussing modern awards, uh, which are another source of minimum employment entitlements. Uh, well, what is a modern award? Um, it's a document which sets out the minimum terms and conditions of employment on top of the NES. Um, there are more than 120 uh, industry or occupational awards at the moment that cover most people who work in Australia. Modern awards will provide for entitlements such as minimum rates of pay, uh, breaks, allowances, penalty rates and overtime rates. Now there are a few modern awards that may be relevant for tech businesses. These include the Professional Employees Award, uh, the Clerks Private Sector Award uh, and the Miscellaneous Award and I'll just provide a brief overview of each of these awards now. The Professional Employees Award is an industry and occupational award that covers employees mainly engaged in the information technology, medical research, quality auditing or telecommunications industries. The awards definition of the information technology industry should hopefully appear on the slide now. And employees may also be covered by this award if they perform professional engineering or scientific duties. Moving on to the Clerks Private Sector Award now, um, that's an occupational award uh, that covers employees who mainly carry out clerical and administrative work in the private sector. And the Miscellaneous Award operates as a bit of a catch-all award um, that covers employers and employees um, who aren't covered by any other modern award uh, with some exclusions. <clears throat> 
Now, award coverage can be very difficult to determine, um, especially if your tech business doesn't fit nicely uh, within the industry set out in the Professional Employees Award, um, or if your employees don't fit within the classifications of an award. Um, it's possible for multiple awards to cover your business and your employees. Um, so for example, your engineers may be covered by the Professional Employees Award, and your receptionists may be covered by the Clerks Award. It's also possible for you to have employees who aren't covered by any award, um, such as your executive or managerial employees. Once you have determined the modern award um, or awards that cover your business and your employees, it's useful to refer to the pay guides, which are published by the Fair Work Ombudsman. Uh, the pay guides include the current minimum pay rates, uh, penalty rates and allowances for each award. I'll now hand it over to Sophie to discuss uh, the distinction between employees and contractors. Thanks very much, Dixon. And look, I think as we can see, there are quite a number of minimum entitlements which are owing to employees. So certainly as a business owner, understanding the correct entitlements you owe to your workers is going to be essential as your obligations are going to differ quite substantially depending on whether your workers are actually employees or whether they are independent contractors. Now, the reason this is so important is because for many businesses, getting this classification wrong can have quite significant repercussions, not only as far as PayYG withholding, superannuation and payroll tax consequences, um, but there are also obviously costs associated with employee entitlements. So classifying your workers correctly um, as either employees or contractors is really quite critical for ensuring your legal compliance. Now, as an employer, it's really important to understand that there are actually quite a number of different factors that you need to consider when you are classifying your workers correctly. Um, we've set out a few of these matters on the next few slides. So for starters, you'll need to consider their working hours. Does your worker have regular work hours or are they going to have the freedom to decide what hours they want to work? You'll also need to consider things like the level of control you're going to have over the work that they're performing. So is your worker working under the direction and control of you as their employer? Or are they going to have quite a high degree of control in the hours that they work and, and how they actually complete services? Another quite relevant consideration is going to be who bears the commercial and financial risk in the arrangement. Now, obviously employers will generally bear responsibility for their employees, um, but contractors will generally be responsible for any poor work whilst performing the services. And for that reason, they do generally hold their own insurance policies. Now, you also wanna consider what your workers' expectation is of work. You know, are they expecting regular and systematic hours on an ongoing basis, or are they really being engaged just for a specific project or task only with no ongoing expectation of work beyond that project? Now, turning to the next slide, other factors that we would need to consider would be the method of payment, who's responsible for the supplying of tools and equipment, and also whether or not super contributions are payable. Now, employees are generally paid, obviously, according to a regular pay cycle, like most of us, um, and they also don't generally need to supply their own equipment. They'll also have super contributions paid into their nominated superannuation fund. Now, by contrast, contractors will usually invoice you for their own ABN for services provided, and they'll generally also supply their own tools and equipment. Contractors also generally will manage their own superannuation. However, be mindful that there are actually some exceptions to this. So it's quite a common misconception that contractors are always responsible for their super, and that's definitely not the case. So we certainly would always recommend that you do seek advice from an accountant or a tax lawyer on that point if you've got any concerns. Now, as far as the remaining factors you'd need to consider, the next point would be taxation. So does your worker pay their tax, which is deducted through arrangements like PayYG, or are they a contractor who would be responsible for paying their own tax and GST to the ATO? And then we've got leave entitlements. So does the person benefit from leave entitlements like annual leave or personal leave? Um, because if so, they're more likely to look like an employee because contractors don't have the benefit of those leave entitlements. And then finally, we need to consider the right to delegate tasks. Now, generally, employees are not going to be able to delegate their duties, whereas contractors can certainly have the ability to delegate their tasks. 
And you'll probably find this is actually quite common practice where, you know, your head contractor, for example, might subcontract out their services. And that is certainly very possible to do with a contractor arrangement as opposed to an employment relationship. Now, obviously there are a lot of factors that we do need to consider, and these are all helpful in distinguishing between employees and contractors. One thing to make sure you are doing is making sure that you've got a relevant and written agreement, which clearly and appropriately reflects the true nature of the relationship between you and your worker. And this is actually now more important than ever. Courts have previously applied what was called a multifactorial test to assessing whether a worker was an employee or a contractor. And for your purposes, that test basically involved a little bit of a balancing act of balancing those various factors that we've just gone through and weighing up to see on balance whether that person looked more like an employee or more like a contractor. So on that previous test, the terms of the contract were certainly a relevant consideration, but they weren't decisive. Um, and how the relationship actually played out in practice was always a major consideration. However, the courts do like to keep us guessing and the High Court has actually very recently in February this year, disavowed this approach. And based on the new test, essentially the High Court has said that the focus should now be exclusively on the rights and obligations in the contract itself, rather than what actually happened in the working relationship as it unfolded. So this basically means that in order to determine whether a person is an employee or an independent contractor, it's now going to be more necessary than ever to look at the legal rights and obligations agreed under the relevant contract, at least in circumstances where the party's relationship is committed to a contract. So in terms of what this means for you, well, as an employer, it's obviously essential that you understand the distinction between whether a worker is an employee or a contractor, as that difference is going to have quite a significant impact on the worker's entitlements. But the best possible protection and, and the main thing that you can take away from this section of the webinar, if anything, is that the best protection you can have will be your written agreements. And any contract that you enter into with your workers should clearly indicate whether you intend them to be an employee or a contractor. So I'll now turn back over to Dixon and he's now going to walk us through uh, some key contractual terms that we do recommend be included in employment contracts for tech businesses specifically. Thanks Sophie. Um, number of different uh, contractual terms are going to be really important um, to protect your business uh, and one of which is confidential information. Um, this is one of the key assets uh, of a tech business. Uh, and your employees may actually gain access to your valuable confidential information during their employment. Um, so it's really important to ensure that the information uh, remains confidential uh, and isn't disclosed to others, uh, especially to your competitors. So confidential information includes information that the law says is confidential, um, such as trade secrets and privacy laws, and information that is defined as confidential in a contract. Uh, such as business and marketing plans and strategies, uh, company manuals, uh, financial information and client and supplier lists. It's worth noting that confidential information doesn't include um, information that's already in the public domain, uh, information that you've authorised your employee to disclose, um, or might be reasonably required by your employee's duties to disclose. It doesn't include information disclosed by your employee to their professional advisor. Uh, and also information that's required to be disclosed by law, um, for example, in court proceedings. So in order to protect the confidential information of your tech business, we suggest including a confidentiality clause in the employment contract. Uh, the key provisions to include in the contract um, are a comprehensive definition of confidential information, the obligations of the parties in relation to confidential information, uh, and importantly, that your employee is restricted from disclosing confidential information during or after their employment, and also damages and indemnity provisions uh, in the event that there is a breach of their obligations. Uh, so if you will now discuss some of the other key terms in an employment contract. Thanks, Dixon. So turning to another key contractual term, uh, the next one we're going to have a chat about is protections in relation to intellectual property or IP. 
Now, as most of you are probably already aware, IP is essentially a term that's applied quite broadly to anything that's created, invented, designed or written by an individual. And particularly for tech businesses, IP is often the most valuable asset of a technology business. So it's incredibly important for employers to make sure that they are taking these kinds of proactive steps to secure and protect their IP rights. Now, similar to confidential information, one of the key ways to ensure that all IP created during the course of the employment is secured is to include carefully drafted IP provisions in an employment agreement. And this is obviously going to be especially important if creative or inventive outputs are expected or possible in the performance of an employee's duties. Now, Addressing matters concerning IP in an employment contract will really serve two main purposes. So first of all, it's really going to ensure that the business protects and secures the IP rights they need to leverage their IP assets. And second of all, it's really going to work to minimise the risk of disputes with current and former employees in relation to IP. So as far as the particular provisions that we would recommend including as express terms of the employment contract, the first thing we would certainly recommend including would be a really clear and expansive definition of IP. And obviously, depending on what types of IP rights are relevant to the employment relationship, there may also be related definitions of moral rights and inventions. Now, secondly, we'd also want to include a statement which effectively confirms the employer's IP ownership of all IP that's created by the employee in performing their duties under their employment contract. And hand in hand with that would also be an assignment provision, which would clearly assign all right, title and interest in current and future IP that will be created or, or even just contributed to by the employee to their employer. We'd also generally like to see an obligation on the employee to keep the employer's IP confidential, not only during the employment, but also post termination. And finally, a consent clause, which would require the employee to essentially consent to their work being used without proper attribution in relation to moral rights. So as you can see, there are quite a few key provisions relating to IP and for that reason, it is really important that the terms of employment are entered into with carefully drafted provisions related to IP to avoid any future dis disputes in relation to the provision of that IP and who owns what. Now, the next key employment sort of consideration to include in your contracts would be restraints of trade. Now, as a lot of you are probably aware, at the conclusion of the employment contract, a former employee is effectively free to trade as they wish, including with your competitors or even your clients who they may have worked with during the course of their employment. So for that reason, obviously many employers of tech businesses will elect to include what are called post-employment restraints of trade in an employment contract, which basically seek to limit the post-employment work activities of a former employee. Now, as far as the key contractual terms we would generally recommend for a tech business in relation to restraints, we would normally recommend including restraints in areas such as non-competition, so that type of clause would effectively seek to prevent your former employee from engaging in activities which are in competition with your business or any of the areas of your business that they worked in during the course of their employment. And also restraints in the area of non-solicitation or non-poaching. Um, and those provisions can apply not only to your clients, your customers, but they can also extend to preventing your former employee from soliciting your other employees or your other contractors or suppliers who they may have worked with closely during the course of their employment. Now, as far as the drafting of these types of clauses, as with anything, we do recommend that these clauses are drafted quite carefully. And with that in mind, we generally recommend drafting restraints as a series of what are called cascading or ladder clauses with successively reduced restraint areas and restraint periods, similar to the example that we've set out on this slide. So as you'll see here, we've essentially got independent and severable paragraphs that can essentially be struck out if they are unreasonable, thereby leaving the remaining alternatives to still be enforceable. 
So for example, if the court were to find the restraint period of 12 months here, anywhere in Australia to be unreasonable, then it can effectively sever those unreasonable clauses and look to the lesser restraint periods and restraint areas to determine whether they are reasonable and that the restraint can still be upheld to some extent. Now, of course, even if we have the best drafted restraint of trade clause in the world, there are some enforcement obstacles that we do need to be mindful of when it comes to restraints of trade. And the difficulty that you'll have is that in Australia, the common law position is that restraints of trade are void for, attend for offending public policy. And that basically means that they're considered to be against the public interest due to their limitation on the right to trade freely. So what that means is that if you are ever seeking to enforce a restraint clause, you're basically going to need to demonstrate two key elements. So the first is that the business has got legitimate business interests that need protecting. And that will usually be things like your confidential information or your client or your supplier connections, for example. Now, whether a business has legitimate business interests to protect are going to depend not only on the nature of the business that the restraint is seeking to protect, but also the role and responsibilities that the employee subject to the restraint had with the business. So for that reason, it's obviously really important to consider matters such as the employee's role, their access to confidential information, their seniority in the business, and of course, their relationship to other employees and clients on a case by case basis. So that's the first element. And then the second element you need to demonstrate is essentially that the effect of the restraint is reasonably necessary in order to protect your legitimate business interests. And this point can be a little bit harder to determine. It can be somewhat of a gray area, but essentially when determining the reasonableness of the restraint, the court will consider whether it's reasonable in terms of the duration or the period of time in which it applies, the ge geographic area it extends to, and of course, the activities it seeks to restrain or control. So with that in mind, it is really important where possible to try your best to tailor a restraint clause to a particular employee. And we also, of course, recommend that you are actually periodically reviewing the terms of the restraint. For example, you know, if your employee is promoted to a more senior position, um, you still want to make sure that the restraint remains relevant. And the reason this is particularly important is because the enforceability of a restraint of trade is actually judged at the time the parties entered into that restraint and not at the time where you're seeking to enforce it. So it's not a matter of set and forget a restraint of trade, because if you set a restraint for, say, for example, a very junior green level employee when they first started their employment and their contract included restraints, but they then worked their way up the ladder and eventually you sought to enforce that restraint when they were you know, quite a senior executive employee, you're probably going to have quite a lot of difficulty enforcing that restraint because its reasonableness will be determined as at the time they entered into it which in that example would obviously be a very junior employee who probably had very limited access to confidential information or customer connections at that point during the course of their employment. So these are all things to bear in mind and essentially to ensure adequate protection of your business, we really wanna make sure that restraints of trade clauses are drafted really clearly and sufficiently, and that they are tailored as far as possible to protect the business's legitimate interests. And of course, we always recommend that departing employees are reminded of their post-employment obligations upon termination of their employment. And you can even supply them with a copy of their contract again for their easy reference to make sure that they are aware of their obligations, which will continue to have effect even beyond the termination of the employment relationship. So that's it for the main content of the session today. So I'll now hand back over to Dixon to just explore a few other matters with us before we jump into your questions. Thanks so much, Sophie. Um, so you'll see on the screen there, um, we have an employment essentials fact sheet, um, which, which has been prepared um, by our team, by Legal Vision. Um, so that, that can be accessed by your really useful resource um, for you, which will touch on um, a lot of the things that we've discussed today as well. Um, and excitingly, we also have another webinar coming up 
uh, next week um, regarding uh, protecting and enforcing your trademark. So um, in the area of inte intellectual property, um, that's a, a topic we touched on today as well. So I uh, really encourage you to check that out um, and, and register on our website there. So we'll now move to a time of Q&A and thanks so much for submitting your questions and um, continue to, to submit them um, if you do have questions. Um, we'll, we'll start with this one for you, Sophie. Um, question is this, what's the view on stipulating the kinds of insurance um, that contractors need to hold? Uh, and also what's your view on the necessity of inserting a restraint period in the reference schedule? Yeah, absolutely. And look, it's a very good question. As I mentioned earlier, the requirement for a contractor to bear their own risk in the relationship is one of the earmarks of a genuine contractor relationship. So certainly it is very common practice to stipulate what types of insurance they are required to hold as a condition of their engagement with you as a contractor. Um, typically, you'll see a requirement for them to hold professional indemnity insurance and public liability insurance, but also you can tailor this depending on the type of services that they are performing for your business. So if there's a, another particular type of insurance that you see as particularly relevant given the nature of the services that they're performing, you can certainly require any other assurance, insurances which may be reasonable or required at law, as well as, of course, the levels of insurance that they're required to have. And you can also, of course, request that they provide you with evidence of the insurance policies that they hold so that you can be very comfortable um, that they're covered off in the event of any liability or defects in the services that they have provided. So that's the first point. And turning to the second, obviously we did touch on this a little bit during the presentation, but certainly having a defined restraint area or a restraint period in the reference schedule or somewhere within the body of the agreement is really quite critical. And this will be especially the case in states other than New South Wales. In New South Wales, restraints of trade are governed by what's called the Restraint of Trades Act. And that basically allows a court to read down a restraint and effectively select a restraint that would be reasonable even if you don't have restraint uh, defined restraint areas or restraint periods. However, other states and territories do not have that ability to read down the restraint. So the court can't just effectively redraft the restraint to make it enforceable to some extent. And for that reason, that's why we do recommend having cascading restraint areas and restraint periods so that if a court does find that one of the greater restraint periods or areas is unreasonable because it goes beyond what's reasonably necessary to protect your business interests, then they can effectively sever those unreasonable clauses and still pick from the remaining alternatives without rendering the entire clause invalid. So yes, certainly very key. And for most jurisdictions, we would always recommend drafting restraint periods and areas in that cascading format. Yeah, again, reiterating that point of how important um, it's, it's worded um, as well. I mean, exactly. the restraint clause. That's it. As Excellent. with everything, drafting is key. And for that reason, it really is important to make sure that you are having your terms of employment carefully drafted uh, you know, by a lawyer who has experience in this jurisdiction and also who's dealt with these, the enforceability considerations of these restraints previously so that we can aim to give you the best possible chance of it being forcible it, ultimately if the worst should happen and you do need to seek to enforce those through the court process. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sophie. Um, we've had another question come through, and I think this is a very common question, particularly for tech businesses. Um, so if, if an employee or contractor is based overseas, um, do the Australian rules and laws apply, or is it the ones from the country that they're based in which, which are relevant? It's a very good question. And this one does actually come up quite a lot with our clients, um, particularly, yes, if they do have uh, workers who are engaged overseas on either a temporary or an ongo ongoing basis. In short, the Fair Work Act, which governs employment relationships in Australia, will only apply to Australian-based employers and Australian-based employees. And the definition of an Australian-based employee essentially empl applies to employees who are engaged by an Australian-based employer or employees who are engaged by an Australian-based employer but who are located elsewhere 
Now, the key exception to the applicability of the Fair Work Act is that the Fair Work Act will not apply to an employee who is engaged outside of Australia to perform their duties outside of Australia and their other territories. So what that means is if, for example, you've got an employee who perhaps commenced their engagement with you as an employee in Australia and then later moved overseas temporarily, it's very likely that they may take the Australian laws with them. But if they were to commence working overseas, execute their contract overseas and perform all of their duties and responsibilities in that jurisdiction, then the key test is going to be whether or not their employment is actually sufficiently enough connected to Australia to attract the operation of the Fair Work Act. And in that circumstance, the answer is nine times out of 10 going to be no. And as such, the local laws and the jurisdiction in which they're working will be the ones that apply. Um, same goes for contractors. So contractors are actually not really governed by the Fair Work Act. There are some sham contracting provisions in the Fair Work Act, which prohibit, I guess, misrepresenting people who should be employees as contractors in order to avoid employment entitlements. However, contractor arrangements are generally governed by the Independent Contractors Act in Australia. Um, the Contractors Act actually doesn't address extraterritorial jurisdiction. However, there has been a, quite a bit of common law commentary around, uh, you know, the sort of sufficient connection that there needs to be between the engagement and Australia. And most of the case law basically points towards a similar test as that which is applied to employees in that the real consideration is really going to be whether or not there is actually a sufficient enough connection between their engagement and the performance of their services in Australia as to whether or not they would attract the operation of the Contractors Act. Um, as if there isn't that connection, then again, it's very likely that local laws in their jurisdiction would apply. Another point actually on that is also just to consider your taxation consequences. Um, obviously, we're not taxation experts, but your tax lawyer or your accountant should be able to give you some advice around any taxation implications that would flow from engaging your workers overseas, as typically taxation obligations will flow from the personal residency of the individual rather than where their employer is located. So definitely something to make sure you are seeking advice on and informing yourselves correctly so that you're not in incurring undue consequences and that you are fully informed about what employment entitlements are owing to your workers. Yeah, great. That's really helpful. Thanks so much um, for running through that, Sophie. Um, flurry of questions coming through, so we'll, we'll <laughs> keep going through them. Um, we've got one here. What agreements um, should we sign as a tech and not-for-profit company uh, with someone who wants to gain work experience? Um, so please know it's not through the university's internship programs. Um, it's unpaid and it could be for, say, a current university student or a graduate student. Right, okay, and this is another one that comes up quite frequently. Um, obviously, tech is such an expanding area and a lot of, of young people are really seeking to get some experience in the industry um, and are willing to do so often on an unpaid basis. I guess the main key takeaway on this point is really that there are very limited circumstances where employees can lawfully perform unpaid work. And essentially, there are only two circumstances where that's possible. So the first is where that unpaid work placement is a part of a vocational placement. So for example, through a registered training organization or a, a requirement of a course that they're undertaking at uni, for example. Um, or the second circumstance is where no employment relationship exists. And this one is definitely a lot more of a gray area, but it's really going to involve a little bit of a balancing act of exactly what the relationship is going to look like in practice. So to give you sort of a practical example, if you've got someone who isn't committed to certain days, they come in on an as-needs basis, they're doing you know, pretty much purely super, uh, supervised work and they're observing other people in practice, but they're not really doing productive work, which would otherwise be performed by your employees on a relatively short-term basis, that's the kind of circumstance where you can probably get away with it and that no employment relationship would be found to exist. The key distinction is really going to be who is actually deriving the benefit from this arrangement. Because if you are, if you as a business owner are deriving the main benefit from their engagement and that they're effectively performing work that 
you could be paying your employees to do and you're setting their hours, you're, you know, requiring them to comply with all of your policies and procedures and effectively treating them as an employee for all intensive purposes, then that's the type of situation where an employment relationship can be found to exist. And of course, as we've run through in this presentation, the difficulty with that is that then there will be employment entitlements which will also flow on as a result. So for that reason, if there is any doubt around whether or not you think an employment relationship may be found to exist, we would generally recommend just engaging your work experience people as a casual. And that way you can offer them work on an as needs basis. You're still paying them, you know, what could effectively just be a minimum wage in line with any applicable modern award. And there's no guaranteed hours or ongoing expectation of work. So it effectively allows you to still direct them to do productive work that is actually going to be useful to you as a business, rather than just giving them the benefit of basically observing your workers in action, uh, while still kind of maintaining the confidence um, that you're maintaining uh, your obligations to comply with those minimum entitlements. So yes, the upshot is that the legal position is quite strict. Having said that, I will also say that you'll often find the practical risk of a worker in that sort of situation raising a claim can actually often be quite low. Um, and the main reason for that is because ultimately a lot of these students or these young people are really just eager to get a foot in the door and gain any kind of experience. And often you'll find that if they are freely and voluntarily entering into that type of arrangement, the practical risk of them bringing a claim is often lower. Um, you've just got to be mindful that it is technically still a legal breach um, if an employment relationship is later found to exist. And then, of course, you could be exposed to liability for underpayment of wages and things like that. So definitely something to seek advice on. And it's really one of those situations where each case will turn on its own facts as far as the true nature and the reality of the relationship as it transpires. Yeah, excellent. Um, probably have time for one more question and it kind of relates a bit to the previous question in terms of employment relationship. And I'm going to try and combine a couple of questions here as well. <laughs> so sure. when it comes to, say, offering equity to a worker, um, could there be risk involved in that? Um, you know, for example, if the worker is considered to be an employee, um, and, and let's say they're only being offered equity um, in, in that scenario. Yeah, so this type of arrangement is commonly kind of referred to as what's called a sweat equity arrangement. And we do come across these quite often, particularly in tech startups, where obviously the business is in early stages, um, you know, may not be turning much of a profit, if any, at that point in time. And they're eager to get workers on board, but may not be in a position to pay employees a regular wage. So that type of SWEC equity arrangement is often entered into whereby your workers might agree to come on board, they agree not to take a wage, and they do so on the condition that they will be granted equity or some stake in the business at a later date once the business is up and running and really starting to turn a profit. Now, incredibly common, we see these arrangements a lot. However, the main thing to be mindful of is that most of the time, they are still a technical breach of the Fair Work Act. And the main reason for that is because essentially where a worker is performing work for you, they are generally entitled to be paid a wage, irrespective of any equity component, which may be offered as an additional benefit on top of their minimum entitlements. So just because you're offering equity doesn't mean you can contract out of minimum entitlements. They are a statutory entitlement. And so you've got to be mindful that even though the employee or the worker may freely enter into that arrangement, it's very likely to still be a technical breach of the Fair Work Act. However, I guess quite similarly to the unpaid work arrangements we were discussing, you'll often find that again, your practical risk of receiving your claim can be quite low, particularly when a lot of the workers who are requesting or agreeing to this type of arrangement are often your founders, you know, your directors of the business who are really invested in it and want to see it succeed. And they are more than happy to put in the time and energy into the business on the basis that they're hoping it's going to succeed and that they'll be rewarded at a later date. So, where that's the case, it's obviously very unlikely that a founder of a business is going to run off and sue themselves. Um, and that's sort of the situation where your practical risk of a claim is often lower, even though it may well be a technical breach of the Fair Work Act to not pay those minimum entitlements which are required at law. 
Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Sophie. And, and thanks everyone for submitting your questions as well. Um, before we wrap up the webinar, um, we just wanted to take this opportunity to share about um, our Legal Vision membership, um, which is a membership for unlimited business legal services um, for an affordable monthly fee. Um, it's really cost effective and it includes unlimited document drafting and unlimited legal advice consultations. So for example, we can draft your employment contracts, your contractor agreements. We can also provide advice on the minimum entitlements of the employees of your tech business. I mean, that's just focusing on the employment law um, side of things. So, um, and, and as you can see from um, the screen on the next slide as well, um, webinar attendees are also eligible to receive a complimentary consultation uh, to discuss how we can help uh, with your employment legal needs. Um, so that's, that's all for today. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, and just a quick reminder uh, about the survey, which will follow as well, which we greatly appreciate if you could um, complete for us. Um, so thanks again uh, and have a great day. Thanks everyone, bye.